<clears throat> okay, so our second speaker of the session is uh, Jean Marco Vega Molino, again from the University of uh, Connecticut. Take it away. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to give a talk. Uh, as, uh, the Northeast Probability Seminar is a nice thing for quite a few years now, and uh, well, clearly, and I uh, appreciate the chance to talk even you know, in this context. So yes, I'm going to be talking about heat kernel methods in index theory, which actually um, connects back to quite a few of the things that Liangman was just talking about involving uh, subramanian geometry in the Heisenberg group. We'll get back to that towards the end. Because my work is a lot more geometric than perhaps some of the other talks at this uh, conference, I am going to explain some of the geometry behind some of these ideas to start. So what is index theory? When we talk about index theory, what we're looking at is finding essentially invariants associated to pseudo-differential operators and trying to understand how these invariants can tell us something about the geometry of some sort of space. So just to give a list of some applications, there's, uh, it's known that index theoretic results can tell us about the existence of metrics, can give us information about uh, gromov Lawson using methods that are different than those in K-theory. Uh, positive mass theorem, the left just fixed point formula. There's lots of applications of these sorts of ideas. But let's go ahead and talk about some of the history. So you could arguably say that the Gauss-Binet theorem was the first index theorem. And what was shown in this was that if you had a triangulation of a surface into vertices, edges, and phases, that some you know simple axioms, that there was an invariant called the, uh, the Euler characteristic that was computed as the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. You might have seen this in some sort of like high, uh, you know, undergraduate uh, discrete mathematics course. Is this number is an invariant independent of your choice of triangulation of the surface. And it turns out you can compute this in terms of an integral of the, cur uh, the curvature over the surface. So uh, we'll be taking a lot of uh, time to talk about the sharing gauss binet theorem, which is an extension. Um, some other further uh, index theoretic results are riemann rock which uh, somehow measures the behavior of similar ideas in complexified manifolds, as well as the most famous, perhaps, is the atiyah singer index theorem, which generalizes essentially all of the early results, so long as there exists a Dirac operator. Um, in particular of interest to us was in 1973, Patodi, uh, Tia Bot Patodi, were able to introduce a method of proving these that was not in essence geometric, but rather uses what we call the heat kernel approach. And that's really what I want to focus on today. So to motivate it, let's talk about what the actual sharing gauss binet theorem, one of the earlier, more concrete ones says. Suppose you have an even dimensional compact oriented Romanian map. So there's a lot of structures here that uh, we do actually need all of these for it to make sense. Um, the Euler characteristic is a topological invariant. If you have a triangulation, like I was mentioning before, in some sort of generalized higher dimensional sense, we can compute it using this sort of alternating vertices minus edges plus faces minus the higher dimensional versions. But we'll see a different way of defining it. That said, it turns out to be the integral of E of X, the so-called Euler form. Um, the Euler form is given by this maybe slightly looking intimidating formula. We're going to see more about what it means in a moment, but it's essentially the super trace of what's called a curvature form. It's a curvature quantity, which means it's a local quantity. It depends point wise on the local curvature of your manifold. So this is a really fascinating statement because on the left side, you have a global topological invariant. All this cares about is basic topological information of the space, and it depends very strongly on the global structure. On the right-hand side, you have something that is a curvature quantity, which means you do need this Ramanian structure. You need to understand what the curvature form is. And fundamentally, the uh, E of X is a point-wise quantity. It, it cares very much about local properties. But somehow, this formula relates the two. And it's considered extremely remarkable. So just to give us a couple of definitions, we, I will refer frequently to what's called the exterior algebra. It's the tensor algebra of the cotangent bundle modulo alternating products. 
This is just a fancy generalization of differentials. So if you have a smooth function f, df is its differential. Um, we extend this to higher order objects, essentially uh, linear operators on the acting on the tangent level. Um, we don't need to worry too much about those. I want them because we're going to be operating from this definition of the Euler characteristic. It says that you're taking the alternating sum of the dimensions of what are called the Durand cohomology groups. So before I was saying that we could talk about triangulations and vertices minus edges plus faces and so on, this is equivalent where these Durand cohomology groups are the kernel of the exterior of the exterior um, product acting on the space of p forms modulo the image of the exterior product that's acting on p minus one forms it seems intense but this is actually just sort of a interesting way of computing the behavior of boundaries which in effect is what vertices edges faces are so we don't need to worry too much about this the key for us is that the Euler characteristic is an alternating sum of the dimensions of these objects that have something to do with the differential structure. Um, there's something called the Durham, Hodge Durham Laplacian and differential forms, which gives us a notion of Laplacian for these objects. And importantly, these can be decomposed in terms of the pth degree. So in particular, it, the, uh, the, the pth degree differential forms can be written as the kernel of the, uh, the Laplacian plus the image of the forms of one less degree um, plus the image of the uh, co-exterior uh, derivative. That's what this delta represents. It's a formal adjoint. And this is where we can finally say something about uh, the differential structure in a concrete way. These objects, whose dimension determines the Euler characteristic, are isomorphic to the kernel of our Laplacian. So we're sort of seeing how uh, the Euler characteristic can relate to a differential structure. Um, okay, now we can start talking a little bit more about probability theory. So it is known that there exists a heat kernel in differential forms under some very minor conditions. We need, for example, compactness and smoothness of the manifold. Where what this means is that if you have a solution to your standard heat equation, that is the first derivative of, your, of a function in time is uh, a coefficient in there, the Laplacian of the function with given initial conditions, that the uh, heat kernel is a fundamental solution to this equation. So uh, we're gonna see in a moment how this relates back to your standard notion of a heat kernel on, um, on uh, Rn. But. If we then go ahead and define uh, the super trace of a linear endomorphism, so this is basically just a trace that takes into account um, alternation between even and odd degree. We have a theorem that says that the Euler characteristic will be the integral of the super trace of a heat curl. So, okay, this feels like it's coming out of left field, but we can actually see pretty directly. It's, I just want to give you the short steps of this. By definition, we have that the Euler characteristic is given by the alternating dimensions of the Durand cohomology groups. By the Hodge isomorphism, we know that this has to be the dimension of the kernel of our Laplacian. By E0 here, I am denoting the zero eigenspace of the Laplacian. So these are essentially equal, which is by definition. Now going to this next step, this is sort of tricky. But if you play around with the, uh, the decomposition that I mentioned before, you can actually show that the dimensions of the eigenspaces cancel for everything except for the first eigenspace. Um, I should remark here that it's necessary to show that our uh, Laplacian operator actually has a discrete spectrum where this doesn't work because otherwise we don't have this cancellation of dimensions. But in effect, this lets us pass from eigenspaces, for, from the zero eigenspace to the set of full eigenspaces with, I mean, we can stick these exponentials here without an issue. And then if you look at it, you'll realize we actually have by the spectral theorem that this is the super trace of our heat curve. Okay. So it's, it, it, it seems like a neat little trick at this level, showing that the Euler characteristic is the integral of a super trace of our heat kernel. But the most important thing at this step, where we can actually get into, I think, what people here in this conference will be more comfortable with, 
is computing the supertrace. So for any of this to make sense, all of our expressions have to be independent of time because the Euler characteristic itself is in fact a uh, topological invariant. It certainly doesn't depend on t. So there's a famous relation between the hunter ram Laplacian and what's called the Bachner-Laplacian for a uh, given levy chvita connection on manifold. So these are all somehow um, structures that are determined uniquely by the Ramanian structure. I mentioned at the very beginning that we were on a Ramanian manifold. We do require that structure in order to make this decomposition make sense. Um, principally, all this decomposition is saying is that we know the difference between two different types of Laplacians. Okay, so what? The Bachner Laplacian actually has an interpretation uh, as the heat flow generated uh, by Brownian motion. That is to say that if we consider the heat flow generated by the Bachner Laplacian, that is exactly what we would expect the um, expected value of uh, Brownian motion on the surface to be, or the, on the manifold to be, where we have an expectation with respect to the Weinstein measure. So if you apply the Feynman Cock formula and you consider the Weichenbach decomposition that I showed in the previous page, play around with the behavior of the, the, the curvature tensor, we get an expression like this, where we understand U inverse as the parallel transport along a Brownian bridge. And we have some conditions on MT. So what this means now is that all of the previous results we had about it, the Euler characteristic being the integral of the super trace of the heat kernel can be re-expressed in terms of this expectation, which asserts essentially that the Euler characteristic depends on the behavior of a Brownian motion. So, okay, we can get something explicit like this where P star on the left is a heat kernel on exterior forms, on the right side is the heat kernel on functions that you're probably more familiar with. What we need now is an explicit computation of the supertrace. Now, there is a number of different ways to do this, but um, an observation we should make before that is that we know that locally we'll have this sort of property simply by the behavior of the, the heat kernel on our end. And we need our result to be invariant in time. So it has to be the case that the supertrace of this expression must cancel exactly, which is why we need these t to the d over two terms to appear. Otherwise, our result will not be invariant in time, which is a contradiction. And we know the Euler characteristic is. Um, there's a number of different approaches to this. Um, unfortunately, because of time, we don't have the ability to go into any, any details on these. But using any of these number of approaches, we're able to show that in the short time asymptotic, that there is what's called, or famously referred to as fantastic cancellation of all of the terms of uh, lower order, which are the ones that wouldn't vanish as t goes to zero. And we get precisely this, that we that uh, the only remaining term, that Riemann curvature tensor that appeared in the Weichenbach decomposition, passes down to the supertrace of this uh, curvature which is exactly what we wanted. It gives us the sharing gas theorem. Um, I am right at time. So I want to mention that this can be extended much more abstractly to all sorts of differential operators, but in particular Dirac operators and much more abstract settings. Um, and this strictly generalizes it. My research and my interest in this is that I study subramanian geometry related to generalizations of the Heisenberg group that were mentioned before. And um, in these settings, uh, we're working on actually developing this notion. But there's a slight problem, well, a number of slight problems, but a number of problems involving the actual definition of co-differentials and what other, how else to make sense of uh, a number of these objects. I will leave it at that. Um, some further reading if you want. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I don't think we have enough time for a question, but uh, maybe after the talks, if, if anybody's interested, I'm sure our speaker will be happy to answer. So let me stop the recording.